Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, about one of the first killers released after the game came out, who was really showing her age in the lore department. In the past month or two of content creation, I've realised that the world of Dead by Daylight content is largely governed by a perpetual cycle of momentary outrage. Extinguished by outbursts of spontaneous hype for the next patch, next chapter, next skin release, whatever. Only for the outrage to come back again once the release actually takes place. In keeping with that principle, I've decided to take a deep dive into the swinging pool of cynicism for this video. Because today we are discussing my least favourite killer lore, Lisa Sherwood, better known as the Hag. But before we get started, I just want to say that I'm not here to shit in anyone's cornflakes, for want of a better term. If you love the Hag, if you relate to her character, then I am not going to tell you how to live your life. If you, for some reason incomprehensible by science and logic, love the Hag with your whole heart, and want her to bear your disgusting cannibal swamp babies, I'm not going to hold it against you. I will cringe, god damn I will cringe as is my right, but I will leave my criticism there. I have no problem letting people enjoy things. That being said, I'm also absolutely fine with letting people, especially myself, not enjoy things. So go with me on this journey of not enjoying the Hag's Law, even a tiny little bit. At first glance, the Hag's Law isn't really anything special at all. Girl gets kidnapped by cannibals, they eat bits off her, but she escapes and gets her revenge. That's a very inoffensive and basic story, with the worst part about it being that it's just a copy-paste of Hillbilly's Law. An innocent young person is brutally damaged and victimised by a psychotic family, seizes the opportunity to escape, and takes vengeance upon them, a forsaking their lust for blood on whatever living things are around. It's just the same story, control seed and control feed. But the Hag's Law is uniquely awful, because, unlike Billy, we don't really know who, where, or even when she is at least outside of the archives. The time period that Hillbilly originates from is fairly obvious, as is his setting. Billy with his petrol fuel chainsaw, the caffeine pills that he has for add-ons, and the various modern conveniences scattered around Carl Wind Farm, is presumably from pretty close to the modern era, with the fans and strip lighting in the Rancid Abattoir dating him at no earlier than the 1960s. In addition, the name of Hillbilly and reference to Carl Wind Farm by multiple counties suggests that he's somewhere in the United States either in the Deep South or the Appalachian region. In short, we can place the hillbilly into the universe of Dead by Daylight in a way that feels organic. He doesn't just feel like a random character with no context, but rather that he actually has some sort of home to originate from. This is the first major place where the hag falls short. When I first started playing and read her backstory, I honestly assumed she was British. <laughs> Not because of her shocking posture or awful personal hygiene. The nickname of Hag and the last name Sherwood are both very English names, with Hag being an evolution of the Middle English Haig Tessa, meaning witch, and Sherwood Forest being a real place in England, famous for being the reputed haunt of outlaw Robin Hood. Her appearance and muddy theme also resembled some of the Iron Age corpses pulled out of peat bogs across Europe, dating back as far as 800 BC. It's not like there were any of her add-ons or anything in her story that gave us a contrary indication of a time period. In fact, all the mentions of village elders and totemic charms actually did point to the hag being from an era much older than the other killers, at least until the plague came along. So imagine my surprise when I looked at the Pale Rose map, one of the hag's home territories, and discovered that she was actually from the bayous of the United States. Look, I don't know much about Iron Age Britain, but I'm pretty sure they didn't invent the Mississippi paddle steamer. If you didn't know that the Pale Rose was a map associated with the hag, you have absolutely no idea that the Hag was American. That's a really bad way to build a character. If they don't organically fit into the world you're trying to place them in, it alienates the reader because the character loses a lot of their realism. But there's something else that the Hag lacks that's even more of a disaster than a lack of origins or realism. She doesn't really have a personality or anything that makes us care about her. To draw the Billy comparison again, we care about Billy because of the hardship he overcomes in his story is both highly personal to him, and completely defines him. The perpetrators of his suffering, his parents, Max and Evelyn Thompson, are as personal to him as anyone can be. And since the torment they caused him was all he ever knew even as a child, it has physically and mentally shaped him in a way that makes us feel bad for him. We see that, due to the cruelty of the Thompsons, his life was wasted and ruined before it even got a chance to be lived. And that makes us as readers sympathise with Billy. Those of us lucky enough to have loving and caring parents would dread to think of those same people treating us with such cruelty growing up, and perhaps even feel a little bit guilty of taking those that we cherish for granted. And so Billy's story resonates with readers like that. 
and those treated less kindly growing up, might even see some of his anger and sorrow reflected in their own lives. Lisa Sherwood's story doesn't carry anywhere near as much weight, because the cannibal clown that kidnaps and mutilates her is in no way personal to her. There's nothing about it that makes it her struggle. It could happen to anyone, provided they wandered somewhere where cannibals happened to live. She didn't know them, she had nothing to do with them. They were an outside context problem that had nothing to do with Lisa until they kidnapped her, so their impact is diminished, because how many of us can say we've been randomly ambushed by cannibals who just so happened to live in the area? It's very hard for a reader to fully get why they don't author Lisa specifically, if they have absolutely nothing to do with the rest of her life. Speaking of the rest of her life, what does she actually do in it? A big part of the pathos of the hillbilly is that he didn't have a life per se, because his family robbed him of all education, care and social interaction growing up. But Lisa didn't have that problem. All we got from her main law is that she lived in a village where elders kept Asian traditions alive. We don't know anything about what kind of person she was. Was she adventurous? Was she timid? Was she rebellious or a goody two-shoes? Did she work for the good of others or was she self-serving? Her base law just doesn't bother to show us that. We don't get to know anything about her, which makes it very hard for us to see her as an actual person. She's a flat character with zero personality, who does and is nothing until she gets kidnapped. She doesn't feel like an organic part of her world, but rather a plot element, necessary in the creation of the hang as an end product, and that makes her characterization of Lisa Sherwood come across as hollow, thoughtless, and without meaning or emotion. Until fairly recently, Behaviour was content to let the hag's law stew untouched like a turd in a bowl of soup, with all the other law of Dead by Daylight, until the introduction of the archives. And with them, the tomes expanded upon the laws of killers and survivors alike. In Tome 4, Conviction, Behaviour saw it fit to revisit the law of the hag in the short story, Stroke of Luck. And I was optimistic that we'd see some significant improvements to it. Maybe we could get a sense of who Lisa Sherwood actually was before her transformation. Maybe we'd even get a reason to care out what happened to her. <laughs> implying we ever get nice things. I will gladly tell you right now that the Stroke of Luck story made the Hag's law substantially worse. Like, by a lot. I'd like to demonstrate to you exactly how and why that is. First of all, it doesn't solve the problems that Lisa's base story had at all. We are left with only the flimsiest sense of what kind of person she is especially since the story flip-flops after the first entry. We get the sense at first that she's an inquisitive young lady, willing to test the boundaries of her grandmother's traditions, which I actually really like. It would explain how she turns her elders' harmless good luck charms into the deadly traps and hexes she uses in Dead by Daylight, if she was more experimental and less dogmatic in their application. It's a damn shame that this characterization isn't explored anywhere else, and for the rest of the story she reverts into the exact opposite of that character. Completely steamrolling this nice little nugget of interest that this story excavates for us. And when I say steamrollering, you know I mean it, because even from this first entry, you can see that whoever they hired to write this stuff didn't seem to care too much about what they were making. I mean, look at this. Don't worry, Gran. I'm not going to turn into a swamp tree or be kidnapped by a bunch of cannibals. How on the nose do you want to be? Not to toot my own horn or anything, but... Even I could write something with more subtlety and entry with a blunt end of a bulldozer. Instead, Behaviour saw fit to completely neuter anything with an interesting personality, in Lisa's later entries, by rendering her a supporting character in her own story for some bizarre reason. Instead of having the plot of the story instigated by her own desire to do anything at all, it's driven instead by her friend Pam, who is both a terrible person and a way more interesting character than Lisa herself. Because Pam actually reacts to the things going on around her and has opinions on stuff sometimes. She's not a complex character, she's a pretty one-dimensional, mean girlsy type alpha bitch figure, and it's not clear why Lisa wants to be friends with her in the first place, but at least there's something there. Pam might laugh at her dead English teacher or the body in the middle of the road like a total psychopath, but at least she actually feels... something. Behaviour has done what many novice writers do when trying to write their main character just assuming that the main character is the person you're writing your story from the perspective of, and that's all the work you need to do to make that character work. As I said in my video about the main protagonist of Dead by Daylight, you need to know what your main character wants, why they want it, and what they're willing to do to get it. Stroke of Luck makes the hag's lore worse because it actively confuses who we're supposed to be rooting for. At least the original lore provided a framework the tome could have built on. 
All it really needed to do to be good was to integrate Lisa into the world of her backstory, give us a sense of who Lisa is and what she wants, and show us why we should care about her. That's not that hard to do. And several times, such as the Doctor's, David's and Ace's tones, managed that just fine. What we got instead was a lingering sense of dissatisfaction, and the feeling we just wasted our time. Because not only were basically none of our questions raised by her original law answered in a satisfying way, but it raised even more. Why are the cannibals barely even mentioned despite being a very important part of Lisa's story? Did Lisa keep using the power of the symbols throughout her life? Did she go up on them until she was kidnapped? How long between Pam's apparent death and Lisa's abduction by the cannibals? A story designed to illuminate what we don't know shouldn't leave us with more questions than we started with, especially since it didn't even answer the questions it was supposed to answer in the first place. And before I go any further, can I just address how ridiculous Pam's death is? So you mean to tell me that not only was there an entire English class, and presumably all the other English classes that this guy taught, so we're talking a lot of kids, at his funeral, she just wound up directly underneath his falling coffin? You mean to tell me that this guy's coffin, which was so heavy that six pool bearers were struggling under the weight, flew up into the air, positioned itself squarely over Pam's head, and turned her into the funeral grown of junky salsa? It looks like it makes sense in the cartoon due to the art style. But if you think about it more realistically, it doesn't come across as spooky or anything, just kind of goofy. Like if Pam slipped on a banana skin, and I landed on a big wooden box labelled TNT. I can see now why they didn't try and write it into the story and just add it to the cinematic, because actually committing it to words would highlight how bizarre and stupid this death actually is. Stupid death, stupid deaths, they're funny because they're true. Stupid deaths, stupid deaths, hope next time it's not you. <laughs> and this is supposed to be an origin story of a cursed cannibalistic mud witch. I actually don't get how they missed the mark this badly. And it could have been very good if they just remembered what story they're supposed to be telling. For example, if Pam had been a childhood friend in the village who'd been kidnapped and eaten by the cannibals during the story, that could have been a good way to showcase Lisa's character while establishing the cannibals as a personal threat to her, her family, and their way of life. It could have generated sympathy for Pam and Lisa by exploring their shared childhood protected by these old traditions, and then watch Lisa's heart break when Pam broke from the traditions and paid the price at the hands of the cannibal clan. BAM! You got a childhood story featuring Lisa that shows us the life she led before she became the hag, gives us a reason to care about her misfortunes, and foreshadows her eventual fate at the hands of the cannibals that turned her into the hag. That would have been fairly simple, and quite possibly saved the hag's lore. But as it stands, both the hag's base backstory and the Stroke of Luck tome story, show us that as far as the lore goes, Lisa Sherwood is, was, and continues to be very much an afterthought. Her story is derivative of other, better backstories that came before, and leaves its alleged main character as a soulless and passive husk with no motivations, no personality, and no real home. The tome that was supposed to fix this continued to ignore these important traits, in favour of telling a meaningless schoolgirl story, ridden with absurd contrivances, shoddy writing, and enough loose ends to open an internationally acclaimed museum, library, and research centre dedicated to the study of loose ends. The horror genre, especially the slasher subgenre, isn't typically known for its extreme levels of character depth, and that's okay. Different things appeal to different people. Sometimes you want a heartbreaking tale of pride, loss, and a crisis of faith. Other times you want a simple story of a man in a mask wielding a knife, pursuing some innocent teenagers on a dark and stormy night. A story can be tragic, funny, complex, simple, highbrow, accessible, be whatever you want it to be. But when it comes to the hag, behaviour forgot the one golden rule of storytelling. Never. Ever. Be boring. Alright, that was my uh, little lore video. Uh, it's kind of a rant about the hag's lore, and what I think should be changed about it. I know it's... It's just a personal rant on my end, but if you liked it, then please do like, subscribe if you haven't done so already. And after the success of the League of Legends video last time, the League will become a staple of my channel going forward. So it'll still be Dead by Daylight primarily, but there will be some League of Legends stuff thrown in, with the next League episode probably being around Christmas time, maybe a little bit later, talking about the political machinations of Swain. So if you're interested in that, then please do... <laughs> Stay tuned, and it'll be coming. But the next next uh, Double Daylight video we're doing, and we're working on it right now, is the Binding of Kin chapter.
because that's obviously coming up on the PTB. It's going to be released in December, and it's got some really exciting lore stuff. So do get ready for an extensive lore breakdown from that chapter. So you, you, you still have that to look forward to. Yeah, that's basically it from me. So I will see you next time. Everyone stay safe, tell your family you love them, and I'll see you next time. Ta-ta for now.